Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, this time with a guest. Hi. Everyone, meet Nameless Nick. Nameless Nick has actually been a good friend of mine since high school, and he's been my editor and creative consultant. So when I told him I was doing this list, he offered to give his direct input. Nameless Nick and I will be presenting the top 10 greatest video game tropes. So what defines a video game trope? A trope, in basic terms, is a figure of storytelling, anything from a plot device to a method of characterization. There are thousands of these tropes, but only a few are unique to the video game medium. Here, we narrowed down the best of these, and although not all of them are exclusive to video games, many have adapted to the medium in a way that helps to shape gameplay, narrative, or both. Now, as with all my lists, there is one rule here. The trope must be video game exclusive, or at least dominant in the medium. So, tropes like the double agent or power glows would not qualify for this list. Oh, and spoilers are ahead. If one is about to come up, I'll put up a spoiler alert sign. Like that. Alright, without further ado, let's get started. Usually, when a player encounters a boss fight, they want it to be difficult, but not something they bang their head against the wall over. However, the curious property of our number 10 spot defies this thought process. With the bonus boss, the player is encouraged to actively seek out a challenge, usually of a much higher difficulty than even the final boss of the game. The bonus boss has found its way into many games. Whether the player is deliberately directed to it once they've beaten a game, or they're required to meet certain criteria before facing it, the bonus boss allows the player to extend their gameplay experience by testing the mastery of all the skills and techniques they've learned throughout the game. My favorite example of this trope is Culix from Super Mario RPG. Not only does the player have to fulfill certain tasks before facing it, but Culix himself was a very tough boss battle. It also gains points for being a giant Final Fantasy illusion. Which makes sense since Squaresoft developed the game alongside Nintendo. My personal favorite example is Sephiroth from Kingdom Hearts. Though I'm not a fan of Sephiroth for his character, the fight against him in Kingdom Hearts is incredibly rewarding. His attacks kept me on my toes and I went through a lot of healing spells, but it was fun difficulty because when you screwed up, it was your fault. When you beat him, you conquered it. You didn't just get lucky. At least that's what I felt. The bonus boss satisfies both the desire to extend the experience of the game and the ambition to conquer something challenging. A trend in boss battles that has been overdone is the attack the weak point trope. While that trope is simple and effective, it fails to provide players with a decent challenge. One way that developers have managed to overcome this, though, is the Puzzle Boss, our number 9 trope for this list. The Puzzle Boss is effective because it requires the player to find a pattern or weakness that is not immediately revealed. The player is required to observe and use their surroundings, rather than just smashing away until it's dead, or enduring attacks until it reveals its eye. It's always the eye, why is it always the eye? In my opinion, this trope is used best in Shadow of the Colossus. Every boss in this game is a puzzle boss, and while the weak spots are obvious, the process of getting there requires skill, timing, and adaptation. A puzzle boss that I hold dear is Mad Jack from Donkey Kong 64. The player never attacks Jack conventionally. Instead, the player jumps from platform to platform until he stops to lob fireballs. At this point, the player hits a switch to electrocute him. As the fight goes on, hitting the switch isn't enough. The player must find the switch that corresponds to the block that Jack is standing on. If they hit the wrong one, the player takes damage and has to run from him for another round. All in all, Mad Jack is fun, but he still scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Here we have yet another boss-related trope. Boss battles are designed to give the player an adrenaline rush. There's a lot on the line. Your pride, and that last extra life you picked up from a few levels back. However, sometimes that isn't enough. Games sometimes will throw a curveball at the player by pitting them not only against the enemy, but the environment around them. This is what we like to call the load-bearing boss. The load-bearing boss isn't exclusive to video games, but it's definitely one of the most prominent tropes, especially of old-school RPGs. At the exact second that the villain in some dungeon dies, the arena in which the hero fought him in begins to crumble, and the hero is forced to escape. It's definitely unrealistic and goofy in retrospect, but it's something that gamers have come to love and accept. 
The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time demonstrates this trope very well. Once Link has defeated Ganondorf for the first time, Ganondorf makes a last-ditch effort to kill Zelda and Link by causing the castle to collapse underneath them. Here, Link and Zelda must escape while avoiding debris and even some remaining Stalfos and Redeads. The original Fallout also demonstrates this trope well. As you approach the Master, he makes the Vault Dweller a deal. Join the unity of Super Mutants or resist and die. If the player finds the files that render the Master's plan moot, he will respectfully concede to you instead of fighting you. He regrets the experiments he's done and kills himself, setting off the nuclear device in the cathedral. It's the act of contrition that makes this memorable. He's a person, not just an extremist. He believed that he was doing good. When he's found to be wrong, he doesn't lash out, he simply admits defeat. The load-bearing boss is effective because the player is expecting the environment to collapse. They just don't know when. It creates suspense in a way that no other medium could. There comes a time in every player's life where they just need to blow off some steam. What better way to do that than by killing a bunch of enemies? This brings us to our first tie on our list. While these two tropes are different, they both embody the same reason for playing them. The feeling of power. Multi-man melee and the boss rush. Whether you're fighting through a massive wave of enemies or a handful of powerful opponents, both of these tropes give players a sense of power that is utterly satisfying. One of the most memorable multi-man melee events in recent memory was the Cave of Ordeals from Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. The beginning of the cave is easy. It gets progressively harder until the player has to fight two Dark Nuts at the same time. My personal favorite multi-man melee is the 1000 Heartless battle from Kingdom Hearts 2. While it does get repetitive, it's still very satisfying to say, I just killed 1000 Heartless by myself. As for the boss rush, I have to go with the true arena from Kirby Superstar. The player fights the strongest bosses in the game, but is ultimately confronted with Mark's soul, which hasn't been beaten until that point. Usually a boss rush is an extension of the game, unlocked after beating the main story. However, in Pokemon, the Elite Four are an in-story boss rush that provides a hefty challenge in each of the games they are in. It's a staple of the franchise, and although they've become easier to beat over time, they're still a test of strength and endurance, truly fitting of being called Elite. The player expects their avatar in the game world to grow as they progress through the game, whether through level ups or through enhanced weapons or even just extra hearts in their health bar. However, after beating the game, sometimes the player feels that everything they've done is over. The solution to both of these problems? The New Game Plus. The New Game Plus is simple. The player starts out with the bonus of keeping everything they've acquired in the completed game. Despite its simplicity, it's an effective way of rewarding players for their hard work and perseverance by increasing the game's replay value. Resident Evil 4 does this pretty well. Upgrading Leon's guns makes for a compelling reason to keep playing. What's a more compelling reason to keep playing? The infinite rocket launcher, of course. Blasting through the Ganado Village has never been more fun. It's fun because the player feels that they've grown and can now breeze through parts that were once difficult. The New Game Plus on Chrono Trigger is executed very well, because along with keeping the experience and weapons from your completed game, it is also the very first game to implement the game mode. This gives the player the opportunity to find some secrets that they couldn't previously find, and it also links to something else important. We'll get to that part later. Although the New Game Plus doesn't tell the story any better or really change anything, it's still a fun little power trip. Music plays a huge role in the overall video game narrative. It serves to establish a mood and create an atmosphere depending on where the player is in the game at the time. Most video game music is instrumental, as it is mostly background music written as a loop. Some games take this a step further by having the music integrate into the gameplay. This is what we call adaptive music. Adaptive music is unique to the medium of video games. It takes some cues from film, where the music fits the scene precisely where it should at a particular moment. Instead of having the music consistently intense during an action sequence, the music calms when there is less action on the screen, saving the most impassioned tracks for the most intense moments in the scene or level. 
Conker's Bad Fur Day and Banjo-Kazooie demonstrate adaptive music by having their overworld themes change styles and instruments corresponding to where the player is. Not only is this entertaining, it also serves as a signal, letting the player know exactly where they are. For example, the Gruntilda's Lair theme will adapt its instrumentation to an organ when the player approaches Mad Monster Mansion. Although I'm partial to Banjo-Kazooie's use of this trope, one of the best executions from a technical perspective would be the Left 4 Dead series. The campaign music itself is not particularly memorable, but it alerts the player to the presence of the special infected based on the jingles played under the music. This gives the survivors an alert as to what they should prepare themselves to fight, especially if the infected are player controlled. This trope shows that music plays a much more important role in video games than people give it credit for. Although it's easy to think that a game is defined by its mechanics, those parts that are aesthetic for other media can both be a technical enhancement and an artistic one in video games. Remember how we said that story and mechanics can be intertwined in video games unlike in other media? These tropes, yes it's another tie, are the definitive example of story and narrative directly affecting gameplay. That being said, the number 4 spot goes to both psychological gameplay and the fakeout. Psychological gameplay, as we define it, is the influence of story on the player's choices in gameplay. By choices, I mean which weapons to use, which strategies to use, and so on, rather than a Bioware Fable-style choice system. The fakeout is basically a situation in a game where you are shown one thing in the game, but something else is happening entirely and it's up to the player to figure out what the player has to do to continue or escape the situation at hand. My favorite example in recent memory of psychological gameplay used well is in Deus Ex Human Revolution. About halfway through the game, your interface starts to phase in and out, like the software creating it is malfunctioning. Frank Pritchard calls you to tell you that there's an upgrade chip available to keep these glitches from happening. However, later in the game, you find out that the glitches were manufactured, and that the chip was simply a way of controlling augmented individuals. If you get the chip, it makes a certain boss battle that much more difficult, disabling all of the augmentations that you've picked up along the way, and disabling your heads-up display. The best example I can think of for a fakeout is during Batman Arkham Asylum. If you've played, you know exactly the part I'm talking about. Upon entering the intensive treatment center, Batman is bombarded with fear gas. However, unlike the first two fear gas attacks, this one affects the player as well. The game looks like it's glitching out, and if the player doesn't know any better, they'll restart their console. The rest of the sequence is just as trippy. The culminating moment is when the Joker puts a gun to Batman's head, and the game over screen comes up. It says, use the middle stick to dodge Joker's gun. If you're anything like me, you look down too. Don't lie. To me, both of these tropes are done well in the Metal Gear Solid series. Psychological gameplay is demonstrated in the battle against Psycho Mantis in the first game. The fact that Psycho Mantis can read minds causes the entire battle to become a huge cluster of nonsense that really throws off the player on what needs to be done to fight him. Then you figure out that you need to plug your controller into the second port. What? As for the fake out, this is demonstrated in Metal Gear Solid 3 during the battle against the Sorrow. Supposedly, the Sorrow kills Snake once he makes it to the end of the river and the game over screen appears. I repeated this battle exactly five times before realizing that I had to use the revival pill when the Sorrow supposedly killed me. Hideo Kojima, you can be a real jerk sometimes. A lot of fake outs with game over screens, huh? Yeah, I noticed that too. Here we have a trope that throughout the many generations of video games, this trope is seriously taken for granted. Invincibility frames. So for those of you who haven't seen Light for the last 30 years, uh, okay, those people have been, probably been playing video games. Uh, bad example. Anyways, just get to the point. Alright, alright. Anyways, invincibility frames are those few seconds of the player being immune to further damage after the initial contact with something hostile. This is largely to prevent repeating hit detection, and if a game doesn't have it, you'll figure out exactly why this is so high up on the list. An example of a game where invincibility frames are a godsend is in the Castlevania series. This game is hard enough as it is, and invincibility frames give players enough time to collect themselves to take on an enemy onslaught. Because of the game's knockback and flying enemies, 
Castlevania would be nigh impossible without invincibility frames. Sonic the Hedgehog utilizes this particularly well because of the style of the game. Sonic moves fast, and sometimes the player can't see exactly what's ahead of them. They're bound to run into something they don't want to. That's where invincibility frames come in. In theory, the player has two hits in the Sonic game. One of them makes them lose all their rings, and the second kills them. However, invincibility frames keep the player from dying from repeated hit detection. Yes, they can recover rings, and yes, there is a knockback as a further safeguard, but if the frames were implemented poorly, the game would have been much more difficult as a result, and not in a good way either. Invincibility frames is a standard trope for video games, but a very important one. Without it, video games, especially platformers, would become much more difficult than most players would be willing to put time into. Remember when we said that we talk about a specific part of Chrono Trigger later? Yeah, that part's here. Multiple endings is a trope that can only be executed in video games. Or choose your own adventure books, but video games do it better. As the name implies, it's when a game can have several different outcomes depending on the choices the player has made throughout the game. This is a trope that emphasizes both narrative and gameplay and it increases the replay value of the game itself. The definitive modern example of multiple endings is the Mass Effect series, even though the final installment had a less than stellar ending. Now well, face it, you were pretty pissed about that. So was the entire internet. Meh. Anyways, the Mass Effect series always made you feel like your decisions mattered. But the best iteration of this was easily Mass Effect 2, where the decisions to even do the loyalty mission and the use of your team doing the suicide mission decided who lived and who died. Wrong job selection, as well as low loyalty, can get your entire squad killed, and doing so keeps you from importing your game to Mass Effect 3. The ending, in this case, would be the entirety of the third game, rather than the ending of Mass Effect 3. Your decisions don't impact the end of that part very much. However, many will agree that Chrono Trigger utilizes this trope very well. There are 13 endings in this game, and each one happens depending on when the player chooses to take down Lavos. The standard ending is usually the first one players get, but then the New Game Plus trope allows players to search for the many other endings now that they are strong enough to take down Lavos at any time. My personal favorite is when Luca and Marley are supposedly reminiscing about the different eras, when in reality they're just checking out the boys from each one. Multiple endings is largely unique to video games. At least the execution is. In a choose-your-own-adventure book, you'd never remember who the names of the characters are. They can't develop. In video games, the consequences of your actions make a difference. It is truly exemplified in an interactive medium. Alright, we're very close to revealing the greatest video game trope, but before we get there, let's recap. Number 10, the bonus boss. Number 9, the puzzle boss. Number 8, the load-bearing boss. Number 7, multi-man melee and the boss rush. Number 6, new game plus. Number 5, adaptive music. Number 4, psychological gameplay and the fake out. Number 3, invincibility frames. Number 2, multiple endings. Quick time events! No, no, no. That's not our number one. But I thought that's what we agreed on. Don't make me get the gun out again. Oh no, anything but that. I just got the last few pieces of shrapnel out of my brain from the last time. Six freaking stages. What? How many stages? Oh yeah, I remember that. Anyways, no. Our real number one is the silent protagonist. The silent protagonist is the most unique trope to video gaming in terms of storytelling. In almost every other medium, the protagonist has unique, thoroughly defined traits. When other media have silent protagonists, they are usually unremarkable or plain. However, some of gaming's biggest stars are silent protagonists. Chrono, Shell, and even Mario are some of gaming's greatest silent protagonists. The benefit of this particular trope is that the player character becomes a vessel through which the otherwise passive viewer becomes an active member of the world through a predetermined persona. It adds a level of intimacy that few other narrative styles can imitate. Without a doubt, I think the best example of a silent protagonist is Link from The Legend of Zelda. Throughout the whole series, Link doesn't have any dialogue. 
However, there are times when it is implied that Link is talking. This is where the player is allowed to immerse themselves into the game. In the absence of pre-developed dialogue, they fill in their own, and respond as if Link has talked to them. As I mentioned back in my heroes list, Link's personality is determined through his actions, expressions, and the players themselves. My favorite silent protagonist is Gordon Freeman from Half-Life, particularly Half-Life 2. Aside from destroying Dr. Magnuson's microwave casserole, Gordon Freeman expresses himself through the other characters' reactions to him. Each character reacts a different way. Alex Vance cares deeply about him, Eli treats him like a son, and Barney treats him like his old drinking buddy. The Vortigaunts, enemies from the original game, worship him like a god for freeing them from the Nihiloth. But the players' reactions to these experiences are their own. They can accept them, or reject them, maybe not within the mechanics of the game, but in their minds. And in the end, that's what matters. The silent protagonist is truly the greatest trope in video games. It enhances the narrative and often makes for a memorable gaming experience. However, the most important thing is that it immerses the player into the game. And that's what video games are all about, making players feel like they are a part of the game. Who rescued Princess Zelda from the evil King Ganondorf? Who escaped a sinking ship alongside Captain Price? Who finished the fight and saved the universe from the flood? We did, the gamers. And rest assured, there will be many more adventures and trials waiting for us in the future. I'm the Green Scorpion. And I'm Nameless Nick. See you guys next time!